Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming along to today's meetup. My name's Georgia. Um, I'm part of the meetup project team for uh, this set of forums. I'm actually coordinating the New South Wales forums at the moment. So I'm actually, well, I'm based down in Hobart. So I've done a quick trip over on the red eye the other night. Um, and you guys let me in, which was great. <laughs> Um, so today we've got about we've got three presentations in this session this afternoon uh, before we head back into an afternoon tea break. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Alan to the stage. So Alan Peggs. Um, Alan's had a long interest in agriculture, which was first stimulated by a gap year in Zimbabwe. And it seems like he's had a pretty globe-trotting career in the uh, after that, <laughs> um, returning to WA, he set up a private agricultural consultancy company and he's got a strong interest in pastures, beef, cattle and mixed enterprises. Um, Alan's going to focus on the economics of calving timing today in WA. Um, with his clients, he's been looking at calving in June and July and shifting focus from a per head perspective to a per hectare perspective. Um, I'll hand over to Alan and there'll be time for questions at the end there. So I've been asked to talk about time of calving, so that's comparing what everybody does um, as far as cattle and WA goes in the south is most people calve in the autumn, but a few, very few calve in the winter. So you've all been harangued this morning about why people lamb in the winter and not in the autumn, so it should be a fairly easy task this afternoon to convince you to do the same with cattle. So why do most beef producers calve in the autumn? So this is um, some cattle last year down at uh, McClarty's at Pinjarra with um, some April drop calves. And if you notice uh, what it looked like in May last year, there wasn't a lot of pasture. But the reason they do it is because in November the calves look like this. So they're about 340 kgs. So they're, um, just give a plug of a particular breed that I'm interested in, Akaushi, which nobody would have heard of, but they're called Red Waggy. So they cross pretty well with Shorthorn. But the cost for getting a lot of those big calves is that when you feed and when you drop your calves in April, May, and you've got no green pasture, you've got to feed a lot of hay, and there's a cost to that. So the question is, is it economic to carve in, in autumn, or is it more economic to carve in winter? So apart from working with cattle producers, I do work in the wheat belt, and um, my two greatest successes in the last couple of years is convincing clients in the eastern wheat belt to finally lamb in July. So this is what um, this is May, March lambed ewes. Um, that's their feed. And uh, that's obviously winter lambing. Unfortunately, that's not in WA because I didn't. I went through seven years of photos and I didn't have that many of sheep. They're mostly of cattle. So that, um, that's actually an inlay in um, southwestern Victoria. They're actually Highlander ewes, about 185% lambs, but they were lambing in July. So uh, my advice, I'd like to think, but I suspect three very bad years in the last three years, up until this year, finally convinced my clients in the Eastern Wheat Belt to change their time of lambing. So uh, my next task is to convince clients who run cattle to change their time of calving. So um, what happens if you to change your time of calving, you've got to put your bulls in at a different time. So what happens if you put your bulls in on the 15th of September and not the 15th of July? So this is a real-world case with some uh, cows down at Oakford. For those who don't know where Oakford is, it's about 46 k south of Perth. So it's pretty Lemonade Valley, 750 mils rainfall, lots of kaikuyu, um, but very expensive land. So um, these were some Angus cows that came out of the wheat belt that were adjusted. And because they came out of the wheat belt, uh, they were 
winter calving cows when they came down to Oakford. So that's why we put the bulls in on the 15th of September. So this is a bit of a real world case of winter calving. Um, so why, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that they came down is because the three dry years up until this year out in the wheat belt had reduced the amount of feed for these cows. So, so we took about 150 cows on adjustment and um, we're instructed to feed no hay. So they came down in December to start calving in June. So this was pretty strange for the manager because he was absolutely incredulous that you don't feed, that the instruction was do not feed hay. He did feed a little bit, but we had to rip the money for that. But anyway, um, basically these cows didn't get any feed. So this example is, is not a bad case study. Um, but we kind of, there has been a lot of information around and I did a little bit of a lit search for this talk, and you'd actually go back to the 1960s and see work done on autumn carving versus winter carving, but probably the most recent work was done by the Department of Ag. Um, some older people here might know the names of like Brian McIntyre and Jeff Tudor and Bill Smart, um, who did a lot of work at Old Kaya, at both Fairbridge and, and Wagerup, and they compared winter calving cows with autumn calving cows. So what, what they found is that the autumn calving cows, and, and these were sort of actually calving sort of more like March rather than April or beginning calving. So, that, you know, they were pretty good. They were threaded. They weaned calves at the end of, I think, in, into January, with about 350 kilos compared to the winter ones, about 270. So, yeah, big difference. In, uh, in weaning weight. Um, but what they noticed was that the cows that calved in, um, in winter were much fatter than the cows that calved in, in autumn and there was a lot more feed and they could have actually run it at a higher stocking rate. So the next couple of years they did run them at a higher stocking rate. Anyway, cut a long story short, um, Tony Della Bosca, who's an ag economist, down at Bunbury sort of crunched all the numbers and on the numbers that cost of inputs and and out and prices for outputs in at that time, there wasn't a lot of difference between autumn carving and winter carving at 20% by a stocking rate. Um, nonetheless, so not many people really adopted um, the outcome <laughs> of that research, unfortunately. Um, but not to be disheartened, um, if anybody uh, reads MLA's feed, most recent feedback, there's a nice little example here of um, Michael Krobiak, who farms down in the southeast of South Australia, another sort of Lemonade Valley part of Australia, very, very nice, but yeah, it just happened to have a little article there um, in the last four weeks talking about why he switched from autumn carving to winter carving. Um, and I think you could argue the same logic, well, you can argue, argue the same logic here, um, which is, because he just sent me a text during the meeting, um, saying that you know, one reason he changed was because his market changed. He wasn't trying to turn off big wieners because his market now is um, sort of 18 to 21 month old feeder steers to go into a feedlot. So it didn't matter if the calves were a lighter weight because they could make that weight up in the next year. So that, that was his rationale, that he was able to increase his stocking rate by 20% as a result and you know, he believes, he thinks he's financially better off. Anyway, um, let's get to the argument. Is it more economic to carve in autumn and winter, and I just wanted to, took a photo last week of those same cows that you saw being mated. Um, they've now got F1 Akaushi Angus calves at foot, and that's what they looked like on Friday when there was a little bit of sun shining, and they look even better now because they've had 
four days of sun. Um, so yeah, they've all they've done pretty well. So I just thought I'd uh, be a consultant, crunch the numbers. Of course, we all want to see the numbers. <laughs> so um, when we're comparing time of carving, what we're really comparing is about a sixty days, sixty days of extra growing that are shimming your wean at the same time. Um, that the autumn calves have over the, the winter calves. Um, so if you're mating the 15th of July to calves sort of around April, generally that's before the break of the season, unless it's like this year, but like many of us, that's sort of been a, probably one year in 20. Um, so as a consequence, you've got to feed pasture hay. And in this farm, which we used to run Angus cattle, uh, we used to allow a thousand kgs of of hay per animal, and our stocking rate was around about one breeding cow per hectare. So, to produce enough hay, we need to allocate about thirty six hectares of our two hundred hectares to to hay, um, which often we planted, and quite frequently we never grazed until after we'd cut it for hay. But assuming that you could get some grazing off it before you close it up at about this time of the year. Um, you could run about 155 breeders plus 27 replacements and that's assuming you sell all your calves off and that you achieve a 90% calving rate. And the weaning weight that I've assumed, the heifer's about 310 and the steer's about 330. Um, and uh, I wasn't good enough with all the grass so I just copied this out of... Um, Happened that Tony Dallabosca did, but what he actually did was he, if you, um, you might, I think Phil might have had up there the MLA feed calculator, so you can actually go there into the MLA, look, go on that calculator, put in the cattle that you're running and the time of carving, and you can compare um, the feed requirements. And um, you can see that the uh, the darker line, which I think's blue or black, um, is the autumn carving cows and the, the red are the winter. You can see that there's not much of a gap with the uh, winter carving, but there's quite a gap with the autumn carving. So, yeah, that's the gap that Phil was talking about that you need to fill um, if you're carving in, in autumn compared to carving in winter, and you can see the gap is much bigger for the autumn carving cows compared to the winter. Um, so the thing about if you just ran them at the same stocking rate and you didn't cut any hay, just remember the uh, uh, the client said no hay, then that you had 36 extra hectares so you could run more cows, um, so you produce more calves, but of course they're going to be lighter. The heifer's going to be about 250 and the steer's about 270. Um, but... Because they are carving later, you could actually push that a bit harder and I've assumed that you could do what they did at Wadrop, that's run another 20%. So you sort of go from about 12.7 hec point DSEs per hectare to about 15.3. Um, and by pushing in another 20% higher stocking rate, you get your breeders up to 185 compared to 150, so you've got more calves to sell. And I assume you still maintain the same weight because pretty much that's what they achieved at Wage Up and Fairbridge. Um, like any um, budget, you've got to assume a few weights and a few prices as far as cattle goes. So you can see the prices that I've assumed. Um, I've put four dollars seventy-five in for three thirty kg steer wieners and four twenty-five for wiener heifers mainly because in December last year I did buy cattle at that price. Um, maybe they're a little bit higher at the moment. And, you know, the cow and heifer prices and bull prices are pretty much where they are at the moment. Um, and you can see that I, I assume slightly higher steer and heifer prices uh, if you took those animals through another year because they're starting off a bit heavier. With the uh, the winter carvers, it's... Slightly lower weights, but I assume the same price, although probably the reality at the moment is that lighter animals actually generate more cents per kilo, but I 
didn't really want to argue about prices, so I just made all the prices the same, so we're just comparing apples with apples. Um, and uh, these are my major in, input assumptions, so it all got fertiliser. In reality, this farm I'm actually talking about doesn't put on that much fertiliser because it's an old dairy farm and it, we do the right thing by the Peel Harvey estuary and um, we don't need much phosphorus or potassium, but sort of just broadly, then on anything that we um, cut, we're going to cut for hay. Um, we in the autumn carving we put on about a hundred of something like Fotomax, a bit of not for extra nitrogen and extra potassium. Um, and in our autumn carving, it I'm assumed I have assumed that most of the operations are all done by contract because that's easy. Um, and it costs about thirty thousand dollars to grow 188 tons of hay, which is about 160 bucks a ton. Which I'm glad to see Ash had about the same cost in uh, in his budget for hay, about 150. Um, and I put a senior farm hand in at 55, which is a bit light on. But uh, in this case study, he has another job, which is this farm's got a very nice house, old farmhouse, and they use it for wedding receptions. So he's got to park the cars and keep the gardens clean and all that kind of stuff. So part of his cost is allocated to that. But yeah, anyway, as long as it's all, every, each system's treated the same. But um, so when we make all those kind of assumptions, um, we get a result, and this is pr probably a bit of a busy table, but um, what we can see is that um, if we just compare autumn with winter at the same stocking rate, we actually sell less kilos of beef. We've got more cows, but because our calves are significantly lighter, we sell less kilos. Um, but our, because we're not making any hay, we're saving about 30 grand, so our costs are significantly less. So as a consequence, our our margin is higher. Um, but the one key performance indicator I like to look at when I'm looking at beef cattle is your cost of production per kilogram of live weight sold. And with the autumn carving system, um, the way that I've calculated it, the costs are about $3.28, which is not bad when you're considering you're getting four seventy five five dollars, but even but by switching to winter and even accepting that lower weight, um, because we're saving so much on the cost of hay, we're bringing our cost of production down to about two dollars eighty. And if we really pushed it, which I think we could, and we are because we're actually running at these cows at more than one cow to the hectare. You can bring your cost down at about two dollars sixty, um, so that can make cattle quite a, a profitable operation. Um, and simply because you're saving this costs on on feeding hay. So I haven't mentioned some other advantages which Enoch might talk about, but um, Enoch knows this farm pretty well because he used to do a lot of AI. And we ran it. <laughs> and um, one issue we often had, we wanted, had to get make sure the cows, if we were for the winter autumn calving cows, we're always trying to get these cows cycling by the end of July so they were ready for Enoch to come and AI. And when we had a late break, we often had to pour more silage or even go and buy pellets just to make sure that they were on a rising plane of nutrition. Because if you got a late break, cold, not much growth, a lot of Bungham clay soils, very wet. You just did not get a lot of growth in July. But the huge advantage of carving in winter, which I haven't really shown here because I've assumed, is that you're mating in spring on peak pasture supply. That's it's not, never better than in spring. And so these cows are really cycling, so it's easy to get these cows in calf. Much of it, and we don't have to do anything about it. We just put the bulls in. The bulls, as long as they're the right bulls, they're fine. They get in calf. So you get a fairly compact calving. So we only mated for six weeks. 
We, we got all our calves down. We got 92% preg tested in calf. And we got the same number of calves this year as the cows that were tested, preg tested in calf. So it's a really simple system. So as long as you're not trying to produce, you know, the world's biggest feeler, which is the old way that we used to produce, if any of the older people here my age remember a, a product called baby beef where you're trying to get 180 kg carcass weight. But, you know, the market's moved on now. It's sort of 220, so it's very hard to get a finished vealer at 2.20 at eight or nine or ten months of age. And the only way you would do it is have Frisian Angus cows and calve in February and feed two tonnes of hay, and that's probably not economic. And the market's changed. It'll, it's quite happy to take two tooth animals now. So if you take your animals through another year and grow them out, you're probably going to make more money because you, you've lowered your cost of producing that, that calf. Um, and I just wanted to throw another one in um, because I just had a bit of a trip in the pastoral area and some of you might know that I do work in the pastoral area and I quite <coughs> am interested in that. So this is Bulathana Station, which for those who don't know where that is, it's about 20 k's north of Carnarvon. And so they're having the most wonderful season. So they normally get about 250 mils of rain. Last year they got about 100 and they didn't come till May. May, But anyway, so uh, yeah, I've just got some cattle there that we've got a little bit of a trial with. Again, my uh, magic red wagyu or akaushi over drought masses, and this is what they kind of look like. But it's interesting doing a bit of, had a bit of a quick trip around the pastoral area from Carnarvon to Mekathara, and exactly the same questions being asked about time of calving. Do you condense your time of calving to try and... and Try and pick the time of calving where you're going, going, the cows are going to be able to calve down and when they're going to start to cycle when you've got the greatest, best probability of having the most feed, which for most of the stations now is their most reliable rain um, is summer rain. Is that sort of January to March period? So that's probably the time that most people now are thinking about trying to calve down. And that sort of means you're likely to have a, bulk, a reasonable bulk of feed to get your cows back in calf. So it's just interesting that, you know, other guys are saying, well, I just leave my bulls in 12 months of the year. The mickeys, are, if you um, control them, mate, the mickeys will get them anyway. So, you know. But I think some guys now are thinking that, think you're on a, a station like Bulathana where you can manage it pretty well, that, yeah, trying to time this, this uh, the time of carving to meet when most feed is available is, is quite critical to increasing um, marking rates. And so, okay, um, for most of the past area, you're battling, you know, 65, 70% is pretty good. You know, there's some stations out there now doing 85. At one station I know has done 50, for 15 years has achieved a marking rate of 86%. So, you know, that, that is the same question. I just wanted to quickly add a couple of points is that if you did go to winter carving, and that is a big change, you know, maybe you might consider, I'll just throw a couple of issues out, maybe you might consider the old Angus Frisian, because maybe you want to, you've got this situation now where you've got a lot of feed, so maybe you want a cow with a bit more milk so you can get more growth out of these calves in this shorter period of time. So anybody wants to throw that back at me, I'm happy to hear. Um, the other one is, uh, you know, maybe because you're going, you're mating in spring on such good feed, maybe you get a fixed, do a fixed time AI program with Enoch, you do one round and then you mate your bull, so you, all your calves drop in three weeks. So you're really concentrating that calving, you're also maximising the time of days that those calves have got to grow. So I've got a few other things there, but I think those are probably two issues that you might look at. Um, if John Pugh is here, I'd say maybe that should be Gelfi Angus cross cattle, a bit more milk and a bit more muscle. Um, but, yeah, I think those are two issues that if you did change, then that might be something to think about. But I'm welcome to any uh, suggestions. Thanks very much. <laughs> Bill. On your... Um or I would suggest perhaps the opposite. You go for a moderate, smaller cow, 
using a smaller car anyway. And what happens with an awesome awesome carbon herd is the milk production is suppressed through yeah. lack of nutrition. So you find a, a moderate animal carbon in winter produces a bucket load of milk. So maybe we need a jersey, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> and if you're going to push it to 20, maybe 30 percent more stock rate, maybe I'd better off to have a a, a smaller beef animal that can whack on a lot of fat. Don't, don't go chasing big animals. Yeah, whack on a lot of fat. Uh, just add, what do you think, Jim? Because you've been a long Angus breeder, so you know Angus cows with milk. I mean, you can select Angus cows for a lot of milk by selecting ABV for milk. But I think you've got to be careful because of the carbon from the take one 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 Yeah. Um, you know, even some of the higher milking Angus cows, you can you can have a problem, and you start to get um, other problems and. So on. So I think you know, there's probably breed average or something is probably about where you want to be. What about you, Paul? Oh, sorry. Whereabouts are you located? Okay, so you've got the you've got the Nanuk curve. Yeah. That that um Yeah. 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 So the question would be, you know, could, could you get more could you run a higher stocking rate if you carb later? And yeah. do, Yeah, for another year. Yeah, I mean, the question is, I don't know if it's just Sani's here, but um, there was quite a bit of work done from this work they've done at Wagerup and Fairbridge where they looked at growing out those animals, the light animals and the heavy animals, the autumn and the winter calves, and they put them through either a high growth in the autumn or a low growth and then saw what those animals did at the end. Um, so, yeah, those animals could still be suitable for feedlotters because it could still be suitable for abattoirs because abattoirs now are zero to two tooth, not, not zero tooth. So that does give you a bit more flexi flexibility in terms of growing out. And I'd argue that um, if you do have a bad year, if you've got a whole lot of steers, you've got a lot more flexibility than if you've got all cows in terms of adjusting your stocking rate to bad years. A bit like the sheep story. You got all ewes and no hoggets or no weathers. You got no flexibility if you to to adjust your stocking rate. Ken, thanks, Alan. Uh, I liked your numbers. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to talk in support of them because the red sky data, albeit aging now, um, is completely supportive of the numbers that you put up. They mirror each other almost perfectly in as much that stocking rate in that data drove profitability. And the better performers did it did so at a lower cost of production. They were the key outcomes of the Red Sky data that's actually never been published, I don't think, in those terms at least. Yeah. So it's it's refreshing to see another a, a more simple analysis come to a yeah, similar it was, conclusion. <laughs> it was pretty simple. But is it yeah, yeah, yeah. And the and the other point I'd make is that the winter calving system is highly dependent upon for success on the higher stocking rate to keep calving yeah. calf size down. Yeah. And so I reckon, from my experience in Victoria, 20% is a pretty conservative estimate of equal grazing pressure through that feed limiting time of the period, period of the year. It's possibly more like 35 to 40 or 50%. Yeah. Each which would I'd make it even better. I thought these cows might have been too fat because, you know, we've had green feed since February. Heaps of kaikuyu. I thought, oh, gee, we might run into a few carving difficulties because a lot of growth in the last month. 
of guest station, but yeah, we didn't have any carbon difficulties whatsoever. So it's either a testament to the bulls or a testament to the cows or both. Another question down. Is there any more definitive um, trials you've had or research showing the economic benefits of the later carving, or is that the red sky data that Tim was referring to? Yeah, look, I mean, there's there was quite a lot of literature written because um, it was all funded by the MLA, and you might remember, you probably remember the research because they actually looked at Angus as well between selecting Angus bulls with high ribeye uh, areas and versus Angus bulls with high IMF, for example. Um, but yeah, no, there was quite a lot of quite a lot of um, info around. But yeah, if you give us your email address, I'm more than happy to send it to. You. Thank you very much, Alan. Thanks, Joe. I'll just touch on some take-home um, tools and resources there as well that are relevant to Alan's presentation. So we've obviously got profitable grazing systems, um, building better breeders as a supported learning program that's now offered under that program. Uh, you can have a look at that on MLA's uh, profitable grazing systems land landing page. We've also got Breadwell, Breadwell Beef. And then there's a couple of tools there that are highly relevant and uh, easy to find now on their MLA's eTools page. All right, thank you.